if your grossly under-equipped combat outpost suddenly came under attack from a horde of genetically modified lizard people, what would you do? Having spent more than 30 years lying dormant in an underground Soviet laboratory, it stands to reason these freaks would have built up quite the appetite. Lucky for them, there's an all-you-can-eat buffet of soft, squishy humans nearby just waiting to get munched. You know, provided they can make it past the machine gun fire. Although, with razor-sharp claws, bulletproof skin, and a vertical leap that puts Fosbury to shame, that may not be a problem. I'll break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the bioweapons in the lair. Things are going downhill for Captain Sinclair. One minute, she's tearing up the skies over Afghanistan. The next, she's lying flat on her back, surrounded by the band of heavily armed insurgents that shot her down. No worries, though. Looks like Wizzo Johnson knows just how to turn the tables. Well, that's not good. Then again, what else could you expect drawing from the drop like that? Unless someone is actively trying to kill you. It's all about waiting your turn and striking when your attackers are most vulnerable. Kind of like what we see out of Jane Wick right here. See, all according to plan. I mean, I'm glad he had a chance to redeem himself and all, but things could have gone way smoother if he'd actually thought things through. Let's rewind back to life for a second. First off, the fact that our new friends didn't gun us down on the spot suggests they had something else in mind, which was probably a lot worse. Either way, were I in Johnson's shoes, I would have milked this for all I could and put my hands up while slowly moving away from Sinclair. At this point, they wouldn't have known whether she was still alive, much less, Annie Oakley, so he probably could have soaked up all the aggro and given her a chance to launch a counter ambush. However we went about it, getting our Glock into the fight would have been a lot easier if we had an actual holster. I mean, it's not like the MOD really broke the bank on that plug tier Serpa trash Sinclair's lugging around. Fact is, drawing from a pocket is probably the reason Johnson felt the need to carry on an open chamber like a total moron. Bro, you just ejected from a fighter jet into an active war zone. I'd much rather risk the ND than spare even a fraction of a second racking one in a battery. Of course, even done properly, the chances of us walking away from a gunfight against four men armed with rifles would be pretty slim. But at least we could have preserved the remote possibility of us both making it out alive. Whereas Johnson's little turn and burn action all but guaranteed Sinclair would wind up alone out here. And that's assuming she didn't catch a stray in the process. Nerds, you know I'm a stern advocate of staying strapped so as to not get clapped. But in the age of the computer, you're statistically way more likely to get your identity and digital dollars cyber hacked. That's why you need to download this video sponsor, the Aura app for proactive protection of your assets, identity, family, and tech. It might not be as cool as a Walter PPK, but unlike James Bond's piece, you'll actually use it. Or as an easy to use app that includes everything you need to lock up your sensitive credentials from reaching the dark web, where criminals pass around your emails, passwords, and social security numbers for the right price. Or as main features are its fraud protection with credit lock, where you can get up to four times faster near real-time fraud alerts and notifications if someone tries to access your credit to take out loans or open bank accounts in your name. And you can instantly lock your Experian credit file with a tap. Their identity theft protection, which alerts you if your registered social security number, online accounts, and personal info have been breached. Getting hacked and getting your identity stolen is a pain in the ass. Filing claims, notifying companies, trying to regain access to accounts, filing police reports, not fun. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in all. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. Sign up right now and Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link. Aura.com slash nerd explains. Thanks Aura for sponsoring this video. Eh, well, dude that stupid is probably not the kind of guy we want around for E&E. &E. Speaking of which, we should kick things off by looting weapons and equipment from everyone around, along with making sure that they're dead. Sure, it's not technically allowed, but I'm not seeing any news cameras out here. Last thing we need is one of the 
insurgent self rezzing in time to watch us leave. I applaud Sinclair for actually bothering to grab one of the militants' rifles, but she should have piled on way more of their clothing, or at least enough to hide her head and face and obscure some of her more prominent features. Walking around all covered up with an AK over your shoulder is pretty much the drip in these parts, so it's unlikely either side of the conflict would try to waste her on sight. Besides, the sun is a thing that exists, and without knowing how long we'll have to spend out here, we'll want to keep it off our skin as much as we possibly can. As a matter of fact, SEER training for desert survival suggests we find a shady spot to lie low and do most, if not all, of our traveling under the cover of darkness. Not only will this help us beat the heat and conserve what little water we may have, it'll also make us way more difficult for the insurgents to spot us, which is realistically our only hope of making it back in one piece. Well, that and actually being found in the first place. However, since the area around the crash site will almost certainly be swarming with enemy forces, we'll have to clear out and find a way to call in rescue. The good news is that Sinclair has a radio, but she hasn't been able to reach anyone since the crash. With range being an issue, I'd wait until nightfall and gain as much elevation as possible before transmitting to maximize reach. Otherwise, we risk using up our battery without contacting anyone, and barring some kind of miracle, that'd pretty much be game over. Now, being a highly trained RAF pilot, and not just some nerd with a microphone posting on YouTube, you'd think our plucky protagonist would have had this covered. Of course, if you did, you'd probably be pretty confused right now, because she basically does the opposite. I mean, sure, I can understand immediately wanting to put as much distance between yourself and the crash site as possible, but could you at least break line of sight with a road? Oh no! How did they find me? And then what does she do? Does she climb even higher so that the men in the vehicle would be forced to get out and pursue her on foot? No, of course not. She actually decides to head down into a box canyon that is a road leading right into it. But hey, at least there's a totally inaccessible Soviet bunker down here we can't hide in, even though it's the first place they'd check if we actually could. Whatever. Too late to grow a brain now. Because here comes the welcome wagon for round two, and this time, they're packing a lot more than Kalashnikovs. <laughs> nice of them to get the door for us. And they say chivalry is dead. Foolish as it was to come here in the first place, that bunker is our only chance right now. And obviously we're gonna take it. Of course, they'll almost certainly be right on our heels. So priority number one is finding another way out. I had to keep an eye on the walls as I traveled in case there's any kind of map posted showing our current location. Although given this is a Soviet military bunker and not a mall, that's probably not a thing down here. Still worth a try though. And at the very least, we should keep track of any signs or symbols we pass to make sure we aren't heading back towards the entrance. It pretty much goes without saying, but trying to double back and go out the way we came in is entirely out of the question, as they'd have to be totally brain dead not to leave a couple guys guarding the entrance. Hiding in a maze like this would probably work in the short term, but they all saw us come down here. So even if this current group calls it quits, they'll most likely post a sentry rotation at the surface for when we finally come up for air. Besides, to a guerrilla army sweating it out against the most advanced militaries on Earth, a reinforced tunnel system like this would feel like the Ritz-Carlton. So, if anything, we'll probably be seeing a lot more of them in the near future. One thing's for sure, hanging around to play fact finder isn't doing us any favors. Ooh, yeah, intel from like 30 years ago. Who cares? The only thing that matters right now is getting out alive, which is becoming less and less likely by the second, especially now that the bad guys found the power. Huh, looks like we're in Vault 111. You wouldn't exactly need a doctorate to realize some pretty heinous sh went down here. I mean, it's not like anyone would expect that they were breeding super soldiers, but given all the gas masks everywhere, it could have been some kind of proving ground for chemical and or biological weapons. And I'd be trying to GTFO ASAP, in case something hagworthy has been leaking out over the years. Also probably wouldn't choose this spot to initiate a firefight, lest a stray bullet breaks out the VX, or worse. Ah, 
gross. It's like someone put venom in the microwave. Well, here's hoping that giant pickle jar was just for observation purposes and not some kind of Vita chamber. Nah, you all heard the intro. This thing is about 10 seconds away from ripping these fools a collective new one. In the meantime, Sinclair managed to use the chaos to slip out through a nearby drainage ditch. Although, the Terries are still hot on our trail. At this point, I'd probably try following the sludge as far as it goes. We're completely out of ammunition, and even if we weren't, randomly popping out of the floor like Bugs Bunny likely wouldn't go our way. Sure, it probably lets us out into some bottomless pit of despair the Soviets dug when they built this place, but it might not, and the only way we'll know for sure is to see for ourselves. Not sure how she managed to find her way back to the entrance, but the same problem from earlier still exists, only now she has to fight through the rear guard totally unarmed, or so it seems. Yes, heartwarming. Reminds me of the hotshot from Dread, only without the face melting. Well, that was certainly cool and all, but she still has to shoot her way up a hundred foot shaft without catching a new hole in her head, which is pretty much impossible. Oh, except not really, because apparently they left Stevie Wonder up there as the last line of defense. Seriously, who the taught this guy how to shoot? Your one job was hitting the well-lit target slowly moving towards you on literal rails. That is about as seated as setting ducks can possibly Get. Despite clearing her path to freedom, the bad guys aren't about to let Sinclair go just yet. At least, not without a little encouragement. <laughs> the enemy of my enemy, right? Yeah, not really. Turns out this hideous abomination isn't all that picky about who it's picking apart, even after catching a mag dump of 762 to the base. But don't let that stop Sinclair from getting agonizingly close to the door to loosely drape some rusty old chain over the handles. Yeah, that ought to do it. We've definitely seen the last of him. Luckily, Jack Torrance's little jump scare was enough to drive off the last of the militia guys before he could trim this mess down into a short film. All that's left to do now is get back to walking through the desert. I mean, it's not like we could actually expect our rescuers to just randomly bump into us now that the danger's passed. Did you see that? Yeah, she forgot to look both ways. Just cause it's Afghanistan doesn't mean you can sleep on the basics. Jokes aside, are those quad nods even on? Because she was standing out in the middle of the road for like five seconds before you guys put her in traction. Check that, she's actually just fine. And it's a good thing too. Otherwise, none of them would have any idea what they're going to be dealing with here in just a few hours. Unfortunately, it might not make a difference as Sinclair's story fails to leave an impression on their commanding officer. According to Major Finch, this this is the busiest they've been in years, and closing the beach now would cost Amity Island a fortune in potential revenue. Besides, she probably just imagined the whole thing anyway. Oh, and to make matters worse, increased enemy activity is preventing any aircraft from entering the area, meaning they're all pretty much stranded out here for the foreseeable future. Awesome. Well, it still beats wandering around by ourselves out there. Not much we can do now but try and convince our hosts we haven't gone completely insane. I'd start with Sergeant Hook, since he seems to blindly have our back to despite only knowing us for a couple hours. Then again, that may just be to keep us from ratting out his reckless driving. The camp medic, Corporal Wilt, is also workable since he claims to have seen enough bullet wounds to know that claw marks on Sinclair's side are not that. As for how we can go about backing up our story, it seems we might have lucked out. A nearby SAS unit captured the sole surviving insurgents from back at the bunker. Only, there's a problem. You were there. You saw it too. Why don't you say something? Don't waste your breath. I, I don't I don't think he speaks a word of English. Oh, you don't say. Man, it's like we're in another country or something. Nah, it's all just a bit. Dude speaks perfect English. He was just saving it for when he needed to dramatically translate the writing on the bunker door. It's Russian. It means do not open. Wow, nice of them to warn us. You'd think the Ruskies would have tried a little harder to cover up their casual crime against humanity. I mean, you're seriously gonna stake your international reputation at a time of immense national embarrassment on spray paint in a padlock. Just blow it all to hell and be done with it. Or, I don't know, fill it full of boron? It worked with Chernobyl, you know, mostly. At any rate, the good news is that with Kabir's testimony, we know we aren't losing our mind. Plus, now we can tell the troops to keep an eye out for a horde of ill 
ill-tempered Soviet Ninja Turtles. Hmm, on second thought, we should probably just tell them the prisoner opened up about a potential attack. Then again, who says this is really our problem right now? Even by car, it took us all night to get back here. So how exactly are they even going to find us in the first place? Well, about that. You see, what everyone here fails to take into consideration is that these aren't just any old lizard people we're dealing with here. They're Kami lizard people. And as such, they've been genetically modified to sniff out traces of capitalism from over 200 miles away, depending on the wind. The moment they free themselves from the bunker, it's game on. And wouldn't you know it, the guys on guard duty seem to have completely forgotten what planet they're on right now. Dude, seriously, man. You could... What the... Serrano, quit screwing around, dude. Yes, I'm sure your friend who disappeared mid-sentence in the middle of a war zone is just messing with you. Never mind all the weird sticky stuff right where he was just standing. That's all clearly unrelated to the situation. Oh, and it doesn't stop there. Because not only does he not even bother calling it in, dude doesn't even think to flip his nods on for a better look. What is this, your first day or something? I can expect something like this from a bunch of dumb teenagers out splitting a 30 rack around a tire fire, but freaking airsoft LARPers have more situational awareness than this. For Christ's sake, even the SAS guys just stand around cracking fart jokes when they smell the Comic-Con-esque aroma of unwashed mutant, as if their normal adversaries smell like fresh-cut roses after crawling around in caves for months at a time. How a Muppet like you pass selection. I know, right? Especially with the way he completely loses all composure the second he sees something move Moving. Come on, show your f***ing selves. Shut this monarchy. Contact! Well, at least someone finally said something. As you could probably imagine, the ensuing battle doesn't go so great for Team Humanity. Actually, the whole thing would go pretty well set to Benny Hill. That said, I've never had the pleasure of mowing down waves of otherworldly reptilian monsters, so there's not a lot I can really say here besides lead your targets, keep the 50 up, and for the love of God, don't forget to reload. As for Captain Sinclair, Wilkes left her and Kabir in the medical tent to go counting body parts. Probably probably thinking they'd be safer there. Boy, was he wrong. Not sure why Sinclair didn't immediately go for her sidearm the moment things clocked off, but it's way too late now. Then again, we already know this freak's just gonna throw her around instead of brutally eviscerating her like literally everyone else. Or it's gonna do whatever that is. Something about this feels like I shouldn't be showing it on YouTube. Hopefully Kabir comes in clutch before I have to break out the stock footage. <laughs> Good looks, man. You saved my monetization. Gotta wonder why the creature would leave itself wide open for attack in such a chaotic environment. Seems to me like it was more than just loneliness, and it could have even been seeking out Sinclair specifically. I mean, these things aren't exactly wearing name tags. So, for all we know, that was the same one that nearly snatched her up back at the bunker. Either way, this suggests we're dealing with more than just mindless killing machines here. Although, if it were really smart, it would have used its super strength to drag her off somewhere before going all Frenchy. Whatever that was must have been really important. After all, it has been over 30 years. Getting back to the battle, things haven't gotten any better. In fact, it's pretty much just like the whiskey outpost from Starship Troopers. Only this time, there's no Denise Richards coming to save the day at the last second. Instead, all the remaining soldiers get is a shipping container that locks from the inside for some reason, but that's gonna have to do. Only problem now is buying everyone else time to get here. Fortunately, it's it seems Corporal Lafayette's figured out their weakness. Go for the kisser. That's a sweet spot. Without their heads, they're powerless! Better write that one down in case it pops up on the test. Of course, like many phrases in English, the meaning changes geographically. For example, stateside, this translates to shoot them in the face. Whereas, across the pond, it seems to mean jump on their backs with an axe and obstruct everyone's line of sight. You see, miscommunications like these are why you should always speak plainly in tactical situations. Thankfully, in this case, either interpretation proves effective and our heroes managed to hold back the tide long enough to evac everyone we care about. By the next morning, things seemed to have cooled down considerably. At some point, the freak show packed up and left, apparently dragging off all the bodies in the process. All except for one. Cue the obligatory autopsy sequence not a single person here is qualified to perform. Like, I get knowing your enemy and all, but practically speaking, all we really need to know about their anatomy is how to shut it down. And after last night, I think we all 
will have a pretty solid understanding of what that entails. But sure, let the medic go digging around in this thing's insides with nothing but a pair of thin rubber gloves. I'm sure his many astute medical observations will be well worth the risk of contracting an incurable disease from a corpse of a walking bioweapon. First things first, though. This monstrosity is in far too good of shape to be trusted. We can all clearly see its skin is thick enough to stop a bullet, and absent any indications of major physical trauma, how can we even be sure it's even dead in the first place? All I'm saying is, I'd feel a hell of a lot better if this thing's head were farther away from its body. Besides, something this ugly warrants a double tap on principle alone. Alright, Doc, tell us what we're looking at. I figured his DNA isn't used to the same levels of UV we're accustomed to. So sunlight hurts it. My god, it's worse than I thought. These aren't commie lizard people at all. They're commie lizard vampires. Crazy as it sounds, this is actually a pretty important piece of information. Not only does it explain why they eventually left, it lets us know when we can expect them to return. That said, our specimen hasn't exactly burst into flames, so it's difficult to say whether this is something we should trust our lives with. Actually, hang on a second. Why is there literally no one outside keeping watch right now? Mon Monsters aside, there's still plenty of human enemies out there that'll kill us every bit as dead if we're not careful. I mean, it's not like it'll take all eight of us to rip this thing's guts out. Speaking of which, upon taking a peek under the hood, the internal organs are revealed to be no different than a regular person's. Shocking, I know. We didn't actually have to get our hands dirty to figure this out. Apparently, Major Finch was more inclined to believe Sinclair's story than he initially let on. And as we find out, so was military intelligence. So much so, in fact, they were willing to blow the lid off some full-blown history channel sh just to get their hands on the camera she pulled out of the bunker. It seems the Soviets found a way to integrate foreign DNA into a human host. Foreign DNA. You mean like French? French commie lizard vampires. As if it could possibly get any worse. Only it could. Because these French commie lizard vampires came from outer space. That's right. According to the Major's contact, the Russians found a crashed alien starship somewhere nearby back in 79. And they were so desperate to get their hands on it, they started the war just to cover up their real intentions. Yeah, nice of them to provide the exposition dump. But if this was such a huge huge earth-shattering secret, then why wouldn't they immediately send someone in to follow up on this? Historically speaking, Uncle Sam's risked a lot more for a lot less. And in this case, we're talking about one of the most important discoveries in human history. Not only that, but any data the Soviets collected on this subject is almost certainly still possessed by the Russian Federation. Meaning, there's another nuclear power out there with access to resources unlike anything we could possibly imagine. Forget pulling a team together. Something like this is worthy of an entire operation. Instead, they left it all up to a single, poorly equipped outpost manned almost exclusively by soldiers that had screwed up their other assignments. And just look how that turned out. Oh, well, nothing an impassioned speech from the stalwart commanding officer can't fix right. Now let's show these fuckers what we're making. I guess not. For real though, how did no one see this coming? Hell the others probably left this one behind on purpose just so it could sabotage us when we least expect it. Lucky for us, it chose to do so while surrounded on all sides by armed combatants. Still, the battle toad puts up a pretty good fight, even while trying to mind a link with Captain Sinclair. But in the end, it seems Major Finch was serious about showing them what he's made of. Uh, that seemed unnecessary. I mean, by all accounts, we had it on the ropes. Dude must have had some serious Lieutenant Dan issues. Well, whatever his problem was, he certainly took care of business. Only question now is what to do next. A quick count reveals we're almost completely out of ammunition, so fending off another direct assault is pretty much out of the question. And with all our fuel reserves cooking off during the fight, the Humvee would run out of gas long before we ever made it back to friendly territory. Oh, and just to make sure we're completely screwed, Screwed, all our long-range comms equipment was lost as well. So, in summary, we can't fight, we can't run, and we can't call for help. 
perfect. The only real positive here is that Finch was in contact with the brass right before things got crazy. So there's a good chance someone important will notice our radio silence and send some expendables out to investigate. Until that happens, our best hope for survival is to bunker up and stay out of sight. After all, we rode out the storm in the cargo container just fine the night before, so why couldn't we do it again? Since we have some time to prepare before it gets dark, I'd have everyone start reinforcing the outside of the container with sandbags and dirt. We'll also want to maintain some semblance of a guard rotation during the daylight hours to keep the Terries at bay. There is still a war going on. Aside from ammo, we seem to have plenty of provisions, so the only real downside to this is the fact that if, when, they breach our defenses, we'd pretty much be a box lunch. That said, I don't see any other approach going any better. Least of all, Sinclair and Hook's half-baked plan to take the fight to them. We get in quick and clean, load the C4 in the caboose, cut the cable, drop the package down the throats, and blow this place back to the Stone Age. Oh, okay, General LeMay. Here are all the problems with your plan. First of all, you don't have a strato fortress ready to drop 35 tons of explosives on them. Second, what makes you think the ordinance you do have is sufficient to fully collapse the structure? Demolition isn't as simple as it looks, especially when you're dealing with something designed to withstand explosions. Also, for the same reason trying to escape through enemy territory is a bad idea, driving deeper into said territory is an even worse idea, especially when they still might be looking around for the missing pilot. And finally, what makes you think the reptiles are going to let you anywhere near the elevator shaft in the first place? We have reason to believe the sunlight hurts them, sure, but that doesn't mean they have to go all the way back underground when they can just as easily hide up at the entrance. Fact is, Sinclair knows where this place is, so unless all that tongue action sucked the information out of her brain, we can always have someone come back later who's better equipped to deal with the situation. The good news is that as uncertain as their chances of success may be, their plan itself isn't overly complicated once they get into position, just as long as no one does something incredibly stupid. Sinclair, you lock it. <laughs> Well, that's natural selection for you. Now, someone, please, freaking blow this thing before she tries to go in after him. Zero percent chance he survived that fall. And even if by some divine intervention he did, there's no way we'll be able to transport him in whatever state of matter we find him in. Wait, wait! Dude, seriously? We were this close to being done with this nightmare, or at least giving up on it. Now we have to come up with a new plan, which I guarantee will result in far more unnecessary death than if they just did nothing. Well, theirs will at least. My plan would be to just pretend I didn't hear her and clock off the charges anyway. So now they're going to use some of their already limited supply of C4 to blow the cables on the elevator, at which point they'll use the winch on the Humvee to slow their descent into the abyss, and then then pull them back up to the surface once they find Hook, something that's just certain to work after they void the winch's warranty in the most spectacular way imaginable. Except, here's the thing, they're not even going to make it that far, because this is very obviously a trap set by the lizard things to round up some additional snackage. It's pretty much as close to Uber Eats as they can get out here. Think about it, the only reason Hook would have had survived the fall, much less the aftermath, is if they wanted him to. And the only reason they would want him to is because they know his friends are dumb and will try to rescue him. I mean, come on, it's the oldest trick in the book. Even Hook knows what's up for Christ's sake. Sinclair, do not come back for me. I repeat, do not come back. <laughs> Oh, please. If you didn't want them to come back for you, you shouldn't have said anything over the radio. As for the rescue team, were I in their shoes and somehow possessed to actually go through with this, the first thing I would do is have Hook describe his surroundings in case Sinclair remembers how to get there. I mean, she claimed to have a photographic memory back at the camp, so we might as well take advantage of it. At the same time, if he's able to move, then we should try guiding him back to the exit. No point in us all going in and risking our necks if he can get out on his own. There's a chance he'll be spotted and violently torn to shreds, but we're all literally walking into an ambush right now. So honestly, it's a lose-lose situation. Actually, it's a lose-lose-lose situation because it turns out the military found the bunker. Only instead of sending backup, they're going to be airdropping the largest non-nuclear weapon in the US arsenal right through the front door. Now, we only have 20 minutes to get in, out, and away before this whole mess goes up in flames. What this means is that we can't afford to slow down for anything, not stay staring curiously at test subjects, not wailing away on already dead monsters, and not going back to look for people who were too stupid to stay with the group. 
For real, by the time they find Hook and get back to the elevator, they still have more than 15 minutes left. But of course, Lafayette stayed behind for literally no reason. So now the guy we came down here to rescue has to go rescue her. Never mind the fact that we left one of the SAS guys holding a door closed without so much as a second thought. You know, the guy carrying both the C4 and the detonator. That said, even if we had been ready for extraction, we wouldn't have been able to. Because Wilkes is back on the surface, single-handedly holding off a dozen or so insurgents just to stay alive. Probably should have left more than one person up there for that very reason. After all, there's no point in doing any of this if we can't extract, meaning the winch operator is pretty much the most important person on the team. And what are the outcomes of all these valiant sacrifices? Well, Hook finds Lafayette right as she gets her head munched in half, so that was a complete waste of time. And as for the SAS trooper... <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot, dude. Now what are the rest of us supposed to do with this place coming down all around us? Nah, it actually did virtually nothing to compromise the structural integrity of this place. So I guess that means the original plane was doomed to fail from the very beginning. <laughs> awesome. Although, technically, I can't say the blast did nothing to the bunker. It did manage to dislodge a tiny piece of steel that landed in just such a way as to jam the elevator in place. So even once Wilkes finally manages to fight his way to the winch remote, all it does is start pulling the Humvee into the shaft, which for some reason he doesn't think to stop immediately by hitting the button a second time. Like, dude, what the hell are you doing out there? Do you honestly think you could ever possibly be strong enough to overload the winch motor by yourself? Oh my god, it's just so stupid. Of course, while this stunning display of intellect is unfolding up top, down below Sinclair and company are being overrun. Lucky for her, there's one last person willing to die in service of her fatally self-destructive rescue mission. <laughs> Well, that was nice of him. Pinky swear that totally won't have been in vain. And that might actually be true. As with only four minutes remaining, none other than Hook emerges from the newly remodeled kitchen to make their escape. And given his partner's nationality, it's only fitting they do so in the most 007 way possible. Hold tight. <laughs> Alright, that was actually pretty cool. I mean, I wouldn't have expected it to work in a million years, but it was definitely worth a try for style points alone. Realistically, they would have had to take the ladder back up, which probably wouldn't have gone so well for them considering these freaks can basically sprint up the shaft without making a sound. Either way, it's a good thing they made it out when they did, because Wilkes was about three seconds away from both starting and ending his YouTube career. <laughs> Hey, that's what they get for turning their back on the pit. For real, what did they think he was doing all this time? Well, that about wraps it up, I guess. Sure, there's still the Moab coming to level this place, but given everything we've just witnessed, you know good and god well our heroes are gonna clutch this. Yep, all that's left to do now is ride off into the sunset and watch Mother Nature piss her pants in the rearview mirror. In the end, only Sinclair, Hook, and Wilkes made it out alive, and it was pretty much sheer luck at that. However, had Sinclair taken our advice and exercised proper e and &E measures after fleeing the crash site, she likely would have never gone near the bunker in the first place, thus ensuring it remained sealed for some other unfortunate sap to stumble upon down the road. Of course, once the cat was out of the bag, there's not a lot we could have done to save everyone from the scaly horde, but we still could have changed our endgame strategy to keep the core group alive. For that reason, I think the lair was beaten. Moral of the story, always destroy the evidence of your wrongdoing, especially if it involves aliens.